Good morning. I've been asked on more than one occasion this year why exchange is important to me. As I was thinking about this chapel and our time together, I kept coming back to this question for the theme today, which is connections. I will share some of my ideas about this next. At first, I was going to tell you about my past and how that influences my today. And some of that will happen, but I was recently reminded by Mr. Latham that the exchange program is a labor of love, my labor of love, and that is how I will begin. I think it would be fair to say that sometimes I'm not very good at doing things I don't like to do. It's not that I'm not capable, because I am. It's more that I try to put things off or avoid that which doesn't give me very much pleasure. That might be true for some of you as well. There's neuroscience behind this. Simply, the pleasure centers of our brain try to be on top and want to be positively stimulated. Responses such as avoidance and procrastination are merely tactical behaviors to satisfy the human need for pleasure. Of course, I'll do whatever I need to do at any given time, and I will give my best effort and all the attention necessary for completion. But in the end, sometimes work is just work, and nothing more. Examples for this for me when I was in school in your age used to include my history papers and other general writing assignments. Sorry, teachers, I just wasn't a writer. But now in my adult life, this tends to be things that are included in the mundane, such as cleaning out the dishwasher, putting away clothes, and running errands. These necessary chores do not fulfill me. I do derive satisfaction from their completion, but it's often because once they're done, I get to do something I prefer to do. That's where the labor of love comes in. Knowing I've checked my work list and completed my tasks I mean I have the opportunity to dig into something which fills my soul. When I was a student, that meant math equations, science labs, verb conjugations in Spanish, and reading books for English. Given that I struggled in writing, I was coached to get that work done first so that I could have the reward of doing things I liked after that. Today, beyond my work at Brooks, that includes gardening, reading books for pleasure, puzzles of all kinds, cooking, and being with family and friends. Four years into my professional life, my journey began here at Brooks. In the early years, as I observed all that Brooks had to offer, I continuously gravitated towards the exchange program, volunteering extra time to support students that were here on campus from other countries. I saw in it what I knew for myself, that cultural and immersive experiences and independence are incredibly rewarding for young people. Columbia Business School professor Adam Galisky agrees with me and believes that international travel and immersion can boost creativity and cognitive flexibility. We heard about cognitive flexibility in the last chapel with Mrs. Waters and Mr. Huntington. Galisky states that the key critical process is multicultural engagement, immersion, and adaptation. Someone who lives abroad but doesn't really immerse with the local culture will get less of a creative boost than someone who dives right in and engages. Our exchange programs have students immersing fully in the life and culture of their host programs. Imagine the creative boost and cognitive flexibility you can gain from one of these experiences. So why does that interest me? Growing up in a home rich with Italian and European culture and tradition, coupled with Filipino and American influence, I would consider my younger years filled with a range of traditions that were colorful. My family was connected by ways of marriage, children, and love, and for this I'm grateful. But family, my family, like most, was also complicated. I learned at a younger age that home is where your head was on the pillow, and to make most of every experience, and to be grateful for everything I was given. And probably the most important thing, to accept and love the people that my family members loved, and to embrace them as family as well. I didn't really understand or know these lessons at first, but as I headed out to Venezuela after a high school PG year opportunity, and lived and attended school there, all of this came into play. My time in South America was one of the most influential in my overall development. I was really forced to figure it out. I had to advocate for myself, find ways to make connections, and I didn't understand everything that was going on around me at first because while I did study Spanish in school, I wasn't quite fluent yet. I also had to figure out how to live within cultural guidelines that were in many cases different than my own. I had to be uncomfortable and challenged to become more comfortable. I'll say that again. I had to be uncomfortable to become comfortable. I now know that I developed a new level of resilience, awareness, and independence during that formative year abroad, and I appreciate all that it gave me. Here at Brooks, as the leadership in the exchange program evolved, I formed greater and stronger relationships in the community and had more opportunity to work with exchange. This included interviewing students for outgoing opportunities, 
and eventually attending site visits to Scotland and Botswana. Bob, can you show that picture? Which, those are my two site visits there. And I never tire of the experience, talking about exchange, witnessing its value, the transformation and excitement our students have for going, and working with partner schools and hearing the stories. So while I do find great satisfaction from all of my work at Brooks, exchange holds a special place for me. It's an ongoing reminder of the amazing immersive experience I had when I was younger and allows me to give back in that way in return. I've also had the opportunity to learn more about different cultures and different people, which is an ever-evolving experience. So I would say that exchange for me is a labor of love, and I believe this is my truth. And I'm here sharing it with you today because I'm drawn to this program. It makes me happy. It fills some undefinable part of me. And while it is work in the end, it doesn't feel like it. And in my opinion, that's the best kind of work. So I hope that each of you knows a joy such as this in your learning, with your teams, and eventually in your employment. That the idea of work is transcended by the personal satisfaction you receive from it, so that you don't feel like you're working at all. What a privilege this is. So Brooks, take the leap. Try something new. Get uncomfortable to be comfortable. You never know what will feed your soul and make you happy until you try. So now that I've shared my why with you, let me outline the rest of the chapel program for this morning. Today we'll hear from four more individuals. First, our own Mr. Nagel will speak. And second, we'll hear a segment of a video interview that Mr. Nagel did with Hannah Latham. Hannah graduated in 2017 and went to Morocco in the spring of her junior year. Catherine Saunders will follow with her thoughts on her exchange experience with her host family in Peru during the summer of her junior year. Catherine graduated in 2018. And finally, we'll hear from Mr. Barker, who graduated from Brooks in 1987 and went on exchange to Kenya. Mr. Barker is the president of our Brooks School Board of Trustees, parent of Lydia, class of 2021, and current Brooks parent of Eliza, class of 2023. Thank you. Good morning, Brooks. Good morning. Good morning. I want to talk to you today about the importance of unknowing the known and knowing the unknown. What is it that you know? I mean, really know. Knowledge that is so absolute, it is truth. Is it data? Is it biology? Is it a history? Or is it something more malleable? Is it your history? Is the thing you absolutely know a memory? You may know your truth. You may think that you know yourself absolutely. However, I'd like to challenge the idea that anybody can know themselves absolutely. I say this because we cannot fully be known. Our truth contains multitudes. At its core, our knowledge of self is malleable. It is malleable because it is ephemeral. Knowledge of self is a series of memories that make up your story. This is what we call self. This is not just my hot take, this is ancient wisdom. Over 5,000 years ago, among the many wisdoms handed down by the Bhagavad Gita was a piece of text that when translated states, the self is never born, nor does it ever die. The self is never born. What does this mean? It means the self is an ever-changing, sorry, it means that the self is ever-changing in that liminal space between present and future. It means we are not static. It means we create. It means we are meant to grow. It means the self is a constant realization founded by experience. It means that in every subsequent moment since birth, we create ourselves. How is something written over 5,000 years ago still so true, so essential today? because this text hits at the core of what it is to be human. It hits at the core of how it is to be. I do not fully know who I will be tomorrow because I cannot remember tomorrow. The self I know is a story built up of events, acts, histories, and relationships, good and bad. When I think back on all of my most formative experiences, the ones that I am forever thankful for because they put me here in front of you, all of them were moments wherein I found myself in the unknown. They were not moments where I chose who to be. Instead, they were moments where I found who I am. Each major unknown I encountered in my life was a direct result of change. A change from home was the biggest one. Next came a change of cities, apartments, careers, schools, teams, hobbies, and friends, all of which at one point had become homes unto themselves. Each change eventually led me to a new home, 
and each home taught me more about self than I could have ever known innately. Change teaches us who we are because it is the thing that makes us who we are. You can feel at home anywhere in the world. I know it sounds scary, but I promise it's worth it. You can make the world your home by going to it. I'm talking about travel. You can step away from the familiar and make the unfamiliar your home. Home will be here when you get back, only it will then be a little bigger. It will have grown, and so will you. Travel to a new world. Exchange your home, culture, friends, and family. This will allow you to unknow the familiar and make strange what should be obvious. Embrace the unknown. In those brief moments of adaptation, you will find absolute self, and you will better know your truth. Thank you, Brooks. Next, we're going to see a video that Mr. Um, Nagel created after an interview with um, Hannah Lathan. It was always something that I knew I wanted to do. I saw a video and was like, that's sick. Like, I have to go on that. When I went on exchange, it was the first year that Morocco was on the list of countries. And so that really caught my eye as well. I knew Mr. Alami, who set up the exchange program there. He was a former teacher at Brooks and then went home to Tangier to teach. My dad and Ms. Lachlan brought us to the airport, um, and it was just the two of us. I went with Theo, who's now a brother to me, and they you know, took a photo of us and said goodbye, and we were off. And that was one of the first times that I was on my own, on three separate airplanes, on my way to a completely foreign place. I, it was just like, we're in this adventure together, and at the end of the day, we're going to come home, and it's going to be like a dream, but your physical evidence that this happened and that this changed us forever. This was one of my first big abroad moments. Get that full feeling of being away from home, learning a new language, living with a different family, Traveling sort of became a passion of mine, and I really, you know, being interested in photography as well, combining those two things and seeing new places was, was really exciting for me. My host family ended up being amazing. They really went above and beyond. They took us to different places around Morocco that we wouldn't have had access to without a car or really going on our own since we don't know the language and are so young. We definitely had a lot of inside jokes as things went on just with our host parents and there were four host siblings. Maria was my age and ended up coming to Brooks and then she had an older brother, Juan, a younger brother, Jose, and a younger sister, Sarah. And so we were like a whole little group, all of us. So we all became really close friends. That was really special. We would have carifa in the morning sometimes. It's this fried dough that you could put honey and your jam on. And I have a distinct memory of going to Chef Shawin, which is this blue town with all these blue doors that's very Instagram worthy. We got there super early in the morning and then there was this woman on the side of the road with a little hot grill, <laughs> grilling the, this dough and it smelled so amazing. And we got like a huge stack of it and the whole family just ate this dough, it was so good. It was the experience of so much food that was like such a great learning experience and really cool that we were able to bring Maria back with us right, right afterwards and then share our Brooks experience. When I think about my Brooks experience and sort of the motto of Brooks is gonna be the most educational experience you have in your life, I always think of exchange. That was the most influential experience that I had at Brooks. It's totally outside of the classroom. It's not what you would think it was amazing. And I really hope that kids can have that experience again. I not only gained a friend for life with my host sister, but I also gained a brother that I never thought I would have. You know, a Geo was someone who became a friend who then ended up staying with my family and never left. And if we hadn't gone to Morocco together, that never would have happened. I really think about those two things a lot and how important going on exchange was to really setting up the next chapter of my life. 
I mean, it's a very cliche, but walk in someone else's shoes, I think is such a valuable experience. You don't know what you're missing <laughs> until you really are immersed in a totally different place. You don't even know what you could learn and how you could grow. So why not try? Hi everyone, I'm Kat Saunders. I graduated in 2018 and I went on an exchange in Peru just after my junior year in 2017. As you might know, the exchange program in Peru is a homestay program and it's my experience with my host family that I want to talk to you about today. I've always been a person who is friendly with a lot of people but takes a while to build close relationships. I had reservations about living with a host family and was not entirely sure if exchange was for me. But I really wanted to go and have this experience, and I decided to take the leap. In the winter before my departure to Lima, Peru, Thais, an exchange student from Peru, came to Brooks. Um, she's the one all the way on the left. Um, this was my opportunity to meet her and to get to know her before going to live with her family, and this was a huge advantage for me. Thais and I began to form a friendship while she was here for her four-week exchange, and we stayed in touch um, on occasion leading up to mine. Upon arrival to Lima, I was so glad I had met Thais in advance as her very close-knit family, the Harufes, forced me out of my comfort zone as they immediately considered me one of their own daughters and incorporated me into all aspects of their lives. So there I was, moving into a room in their home, barely knowing them, and very quickly it was clear that I was another member of their family. They were outwardly affectionate, welcoming, and quite animated, and I was cautious, reserved, and overwhelmed with their kindness and immediate warmth. They wanted me to participate in conversation at meals, and I wanted to retreat to my room. But I did not. I found the strength where I did not know it existed, and I joined them and participated. It was a slow process, but as I got more comfortable, it became easier, and I relaxed. As I look back at this time, I realize that they worked really hard to draw me out, and they did not give up on me, and I am so grateful that they did. The Harufe family was made up of mom, dad, Thais, and her older sister. They had extended family that I met on several occasions, including the grandfather that lived in the house with them. They all spoke English in various states of mastery, which made it a little bit easier to navigate conversation with them as I had studied French at Brooks and was immersing, immersing myself in a Spanish-speaking country. They made a deal with me to help me learn some Spanish and I taught them a little bit more um, colloquial phrases in English that they didn't know. It was definitely a give and take relationship. And while there were many challenges navigating communication, it was mostly fun. The grandfather did not speak English, but they helped me my translating so that I could get to know him as well. As I mentioned, mealtimes were family times in the Harufe household, and I ate so many delicious foods that I hope to have again someday. They were incredibly generous and thoughtful about making sure I try a range of Peruvian dishes. So I was confused when it came to beans. I knew going down to Peru that beans would probably be part of my diet and I had prepared for this. They're not my favorite side dish, but I wanted to be respectful of their offered meals, customs, and traditions, and I'd planned to eat the polite bite that was served to me. I noticed in the first week that there was no beans served in the house, and I remember at one point asking Thais about this. Um, she shared with me that she had noticed that I didn't eat them at Brooks, so she had told her parents not to serve them in their home when I was there. Um, it turns out she didn't like them either, so and this was a <laughs> benefit of me uh, being there. While this may seem self-serving in one regard, I was so surprised that she had noticed this small detail and had remembered and was trying to make my experience an even better one. Yeah, it helped her out too, but it was clear that my care was their primary concern in every facet of my stay, and I appreciated them even more. When I look back at my experience in Peru, I did not immediately see the direct benefit. In general, people don't change overnight. Change, maturity, and personal evolution takes time and the influence of many experiences. When I got back from Peru in July, I did not feel that I had magically changed in any way. 
but I know that my experience in Peru influenced who I am today. Now looking back, I can say that I came back to Brooks after that summer and was more confident and independent. Living away for six weeks in a place that I knew very little about with people that I had never known was a big risk for me, but I did it. I was challenged and truly out of my comfort zone almost all of the time and really am better for it now. I know that exchange helped with my transition to college dorm life, um, having been a day student here. I know that while I'm still slow to developing um, really close relationships, I am far more open to the early connections than I was before. I am confident traveler and love experiencing new cultures and traditions. I see the tremendous value of great hospitality in a new way, and I am more likely to think of the small details to make my friends and guests more comfortable. As for the Harufe family, the sharp memories and details with them have faded, but the feelings um, and affection has not. I'm still in touch with Thais. Thais and her family came to the US in March of 2018, almost nine months after my stay with them in Peru, and they visited here in Boston, met my parents and my sister, came to our home, and spent time with us. Having my family meet my exchange family was an incredible experience that I never thought would happen. I was the common thread between them, and it was a surreal moment. While I have not seen them in person since, then I really hope to be able to do so in the future. They will always have a place in my heart. While I had reservations about exchange early on, I so appreciate that my advisor, Mr. Latham, parents and friends that encouraged me to apply. They saw it in it the opportunity and benefit for me that I could not readily see for myself at the time. This is not to say that all exchange homestays will feel the same because all families are different. But it was my time with this family that made exchange one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. Thank you. It's nice to be here today in the chapel with all of you. I'm a member of the class, I would call it the great class of 1987. I was a participant in the exchange program in its first year. I'm here today and I am who I am today really because of the exchange. I reflect on the exchange regularly, the lessons I learned, the people I met, and the situations I found myself in. When I came to Brooks in 1983, I was a middling student to say the least. My third and fourth form years were generally uneventful, trying to find my place and keep my head above water. In the fall of 85, uh, in my fifth form year, right here um, in this chapel, uh, my Brooks experience changed dramatically. It was announced that four students would go to Africa, to two, two to a school in Kenya, and two to a school in South Africa and then what was called just the African Exchange. And this was something that our assistant headmaster, Richard Holmes, um, had really been working to make a reality for years. He was interested in promoting a more connected world by both highlighting the similarities of the educational environments we have here while appreciating the differences between Brooks and participating schools. I remember leaving chapel and thinking, this is gonna be uncomfortable but the idea of doing something new and challenging really intrigued me. So shortly thereafter, I filled out a one-page application, consulting the library atlas to make sure, if questioned, I could point to Kenya or to South Africa on a map. Remember, this was 1985, uh, very much pre-Google. That night, I found a note posted on the Student Center bulletin board asking me to stop by Mr. Holmes's office as soon as possible. I'd never been summoned to the headmaster's or the assistant headmaster's office uh, before, nor, come to think of it, had I ever spoken to him. Uh, I figured that I was either in trouble, maybe someone had seen me in the library looking at the atlas, trying to figure out where these places were, or I had been picked to go on the exchange. I went over to his office after dinner, and Mr. Holmes said I was the first to be picked, and he asked me what school I wanted to go to. I told him, and all he said then was, cool. And then he kind of mentioned offhanded that if I was going to go to Kenya, I'd also have to go to Rwanda to see the mountain gorillas. Really, that was it. 
And then he said, do you have any questions? I said, well, yeah, I have millions of questions. Uh, number one, I hadn't told my parents I had applied nor been accepted. <laughs> a whole other issue and a whole other story, but it's a good one. Um, so I had millions of questions. I had like, you know, where, who was going with me? What was the food going to be like? Where were we going to live? How was laundry going to be done? What were courses we were going to take? And then the most recent curveball, where is Rwanda and why mountain gorillas? So after some kind of very vague back and forth with Mr. Holmes, uh, I noticed all of his answers had this common theme, which was, I don't know. You'll have to tell me when you get back. <laughs> um, and I realize now that Mr. Holmes did have a plan for the exchange. And, and that still holds true today, as you've heard. The exchange gave us a license, a license to be independent, to learn things we could not learn in the classroom, to be uncomfortable, and to have to figure out paths when really the direction was not clear. So I attended the Alliance High School in Kikuyu, Kenya, which is about 15 miles outside of Nairobi, for 10 weeks uh, in the winter of, of 1986 uh, with Chris Albert, who is a, was a sixth former uh, in the class of 86. Um, Alliance is the top secondary school in the country, and we were told that we were the first non-Africans to be enrolled since the school's founding in 1926. It was mind-bogglingly different than Brooks, and it was not easy. Alliance's rules were strict. We were told when to study, when to sleep, when to wake up, and when to do chores. We slept in basic concrete dorms with broken windows with latrines out back. Dorms, dorms in their grounds were required to be swept by us and cleaned each day before breakfast. Food was extremely limited. We ate corn mash for breakfast, beans, sorry, cat, uh, potatoes, and corn for lunch and dinner. I left at 165 pounds. I came back at 143 pounds. We washed all of our clothes by hand. We had limited running water. And we had daily uniform checks and shoe checks by the headmaster while standing at attention on the parade ground. Now, this sounds all pretty tough, and it was. But the students were incredibly welcoming and eager to weave us into their school uh, routines and to get to know us. They took their studies incredibly seriously. Uh, there were <laughs> um, Students who woke up early were called rocketers and to study. And students who rigged up lights to study after dark and after lights out, a major school vi uh, rule violation, were called extenders. And you were either one or the other. Um, there was no second chances at Alliance. The students were incredibly welcoming. And very early on, Chris and I started to revel in the fact just how different every minute at Alliance was like and how different it was a life at Alliance was like. We only saw each other a couple times a day and we'd revel in, the, in, in trying to one up each other on stories of our classrooms, uh, conversations with friends and just things that went on during the day. We could quickly became immersed in the life of the school. We played basketball on the traveling team. In class we debated social and political topics. We learned about Africa's fascinating oral tradition we made close friends with our dorm mates and study cube mates. We ran in school-wide traditional cross-country races. And we were in awe of the school's elaborate and devotional chapel services. On the weekends, we were on our own, and we made the best of it. Looking back on it, it was very unstructured, and we did incredible things. Two 17-year-olds exploring East Africa. We regularly hitchhiked into Nairobi, met a wide range of wonderful, welcoming Kenyans, expats, and we did manage to travel to Rwanda using our Brooks French to see the mountain gorillas in the Virunga Mountains. So here I stand almost 40 years later telling you all relatively ancient stories about 10 weeks that changed my life. It wasn't easy to go, as I said, and it was really disruptive to what I thought was my path through Brooks. However, I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. It was an experience of immense personal growth, resourcefulness, independence, tolerance, and learning. We found ourselves in extremely different, different environmental, in, in, in extremely different environment, where we had to use every social, emotional, and educational tool to adapt, fit in, and succeed. As you've heard today from Lisa, Max, and Kat, 
I'm not alone. You know, since I received my note from Mr. Holmes 37 years ago, well over 500 students from Brooks and across the world from all walks of life have received similar notes as the one I received. Each of us has had a different experience in different countries, in different schools. You know, the one similarity though is Mr. Holmes's original vision of the exchange, promoting a more connected world, both by highlighting the similarities of distinct cultures while at the same time appreciating the differences between those cultures. You know, the impact really lasts too. I modeled my college experience to go back to Kenya. I studied for a semester with professors at the University of Nairobi. I reconnected with friends when I was there from Alliance. I met up with exchange students from Brooks as well as exchange students who had come to Brooks uh, since I graduated. I was uh, even a groomsman in a wedding of a Kenyan friend about 20 years ago. Personally, I can say it is the most influential thing I've ever done. It allowed me to build confidence, self-awareness, and have an extreme appreciation for diversity of all sorts. It showed me the value of saying yes to something I knew would likely be very uncomfortable, disruptive, and challenging, and my experience was all that and more. So, as you've heard today, I think it goes without saying that I would encourage all of you to both welcome and embrace the exchange students who attend Brooks from other schools, as well as take the uncomfortable step to apply and go on exchange yourself. Thanks.